नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू बी आई सी टॉक्स अ पॉडकास्ट बाय बैंगलोर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ब्रिंगिंग यू कॉन्वर्जेशन दैट मूव इन फॉर्म एंड एनकरेज डिस्कॉस I myself am less interested in nature poetry when nature features simply as a theme than in poetry sometimes called eco poetry which investigates both thematically and formally the relation between nature and culture language and perception Forest Gander a writer and translator with degrees in geology and literature was born in the Mojave Desert He has been awarded the Pulitzer Prize and fellowships from the Guggenheim, Whiting and United Artists Foundations. Gander has most recently published Twice Alive: An Ecology of Intimacies with an essay by N Manu Chakravarti. Gander, who taught at Harvard and Brown Universities, translates books by poets from Spain, Latin America and Japan. In this episode of BIC Talks, Forest Gander reads from his collection Twice Alive An Ecology of Intimacies. This episode is an adaptation from an event that took place in the BIC premises on February 28, 2022. And now over to Forest. My book Twice Alive is dedicated to two people here in the audience, Ashwini Bhatt and Lakshmi Bhatt. Lakshmi where they're sitting in the front. Thank you. This reading wouldn't be taking place but for the enthusiasm of Satya Prakash Varanasi, grateful for my friendship with him and with his expansively generous wife Vishala, and also to Ravi who made real this dream of this community cultural space. I also want to say hello if she's here to the journalist Sorava uh, Rao to my friend the writer and translator Chandan Gauda who didn't actually come and to the multi-genre artistic phenomenon if he's here Jeet Dayal and to the intellectual and scholar Manoj Chakravarti and to my dear friend DP Rao so I'll give you a little context for um my trajectory as a as a poet here now in this a uh, second decade of the 21st century all of us find ourselves better prepared to navigate through a world of different voices and dialects but we're aware that the language practices common during history are increasingly standardized utilitarian and transcriptional we're already experts at navigating sound bites we absorb clichés and ready-made phrases in newspapers on television and gossip and casual conversation with text messaging emojis grammar and spell check programs were offered in the middle of making a word or sentence a range of choices for completing it those choices are programmed to the most likely possibilities among conventions the full range of possibility is shoehorned into high probability solutions these shortcuts of course are useful but they nudge us toward predetermined expressions presumptive ruts that circumscribe thinking and condition perception as globalization draws us together and industrialization and human population pressures take their toll on natural habitats as we see species of plants and animals flicker and snuffed from the earth it may be worthwhile to ask whether an ethnocentric view of human beings as a species independent of others underpins our exploitation of natural resources and sets into motion dire consequences what we've perpetrated on our environment has affected a poet's and an artist's means and materials but can poetry really be ecological can it display or be invested with values that acknowledge the economy of interrelationship between the human and non-human realms 
Aside from issues of just theme and reference, how might syntax or line break, perspective stance, or the shape of the poem on the page express an ecological ethics? If our perceptual experience is mostly palimpsestic or endlessly juxtaposed and fragmented, if events rarely have discrete beginnings or endings, but only layers, duration, and transitions, if natural processes are already altered by and responsive to human observation, how does poetry register that complex interdependency that draws us into a dialogue with the world? There are, of course, long traditions of the pastoral, poetry centered on nature or landscape in both Eastern and Western language literatures. I myself am less interested in nature poetry when nature feature, features simply as a theme than in poetry sometimes called eco-poetry, which investigates both thematically and formally the relation between nature and culture, language and perception. My dear late friend, the Kashmiri poet Aga Shahid Ali, used to make fun of the kind of poetry in which nature is regarded merely as an object of contemplation. He knew that what defines an object is our separation from it. He used to say that nature poetry of the popular American poet Mary Oliver usually went about like this. I walk outside, I see a flower. I have an orgasm of delight, and I come inside and write about it. In this kind of poetry, nature is forever outside of us, whereas in actuality, we are never separate from nature. At this precise moment, in fact, helminth parasites are swimming around in our intestines. Bioflora in our digestive tract are helping us break down our lunch. In the warmth behind Deepi Rao's knees and in the crooks of Ashwini Bhatt's arms, millions of bacteria are stewing. Even at the deepest level, our DNA includes the DNA of other organisms that long ago became incorporated into our systems. Racists talk about blood purity and racial purity but we are all mongrels, and race itself is an invented concept. There is no biological definition of race. None of us is pure, not even purely human. We are a community of relationships. This is the one place where I probably don't need to introduce Sangam poetry, but as most of you know, some 2,000 years ago, there was a blossoming of literature in southern India that came to be called Sangam, or Convergence, Confluence. One of the two styles of that literature is Akam, a poetry in which personal emotions, the nuances of love, are linked with landscape in such a way that human feeling is expressed as inseparable from the place where that feeling occurs. The remarkable intellectual N. Manu Chakravarti generously wrote an essay included in my book, Twice Alive, in which he introduces Sangam to an American audience. Other contemporary scholars of Sangam now argue that the boundaries between inner Akam and outer Puram landscapes are far more porous than scholars previously assumed and that the ultimate goal of Sangam poetry and poetics is the dissolution of any split between self and world landscape. As you are well aware, A.K. Ramunajan translated and reintroduced much of that poetry, which we might consider now a kind of proto-eco-literature, a phenomenological poetics in which human subjectivity merges with the world. Sangam seems to me to be a corpus that has a great deal to contribute to our considerations of the ecological crisis of our own time. And I wanted to call 
attention to this body of work in America where it is too little known. Since the five basic landscapes that appear in Sangam Poetics happen to be the same five basic landscapes common to California where I live, I wrote poems loosely inspired by Sangam Poetics, but located in California. Last paragraph. Finally, I want to say this about the poems I'm about to read. I'm hoping you can be involved with the poetry without feeling an obligation to make immediate sense of it. Part of my strategy as a poet is to draw the reader outside the limits of familiar expression, easily agreed upon values or neatly summarized meanings. I want the reader to experience meaning as in life, an active collaboration of world and attentiveness. I'm given to draw on counterpointed pointed streams of language types, scientific, that's my background, descriptive and emotive. It's my belief that poetry doesn't simply supplement the rational intellect, but provides inherently and sometimes incommensurable forms of insight. Because its meanings are neither quantitative nor verifiable, poetry may offer different, subtler, and more complex expressions than the language of information and commerce. So we're going to start with a poetry film that um, is called Twice Alive, Circumambulation of Mount Tamalpais. And it's connected to a collaboration I'm doing with Ashwini Bhatt, in which we follow um, a prescribed route of circumambulation around a holy mountain in California called Mount Tamalpais. Many poets have done this circumambulation, starting with Gary Snyder and Allen Ginsberg, and extending to Ashwini and I most recently. So first film. Circumambulation of Mount Tamalpais. Maculas of light fallen weightless from pores in the canopy, our senses part of the wheeling life around us, and through an undergrowth stoked with the unseen go the reverberations of our steps. As we hike upward, mist holds the butterscotch taste of Jeffrey Pine to the air until we reach a serpentine barren, red bud, lilac, and open sky, a crust of frost on low-lying clumps of manzanita, At Redwood Creek, two tandem runners cross a wooden bridge over the stream ahead of us, the raspy check-check-check of a scrub jay. Hewing to the dipsia path while a plain's slow groan diminishes bayward, my sweat-wet shirt going cool around my torso as another runner goes by, his cocked arms held too high. Cardiac Hill's granite boulders appear freshly sheared. Look, you say, I can see the Farallon Islands there, to the south, over those long-backed hills. One behind another, a crow honks. The moon still up over Douglas firs on the climb to Rock Spring. Yellow jackets and painted lady butterflies settle on the path where some underground trickle moistens the soil. I predict you'll keep to the shade of the laurels to nibble your three anchovy slices over cheese sandwich while I sprawl on a boulder in full sun, sucking a pear. The frass of caterpillars tinkles onto beds of dry leaves under the oaks where a hawk alights with its retinue of raging crows We are prey to the ache of not knowing what will be revealed as the world lunges forward to introduce itself. Clusters of tiny green dots, bitter oyster, line the black stick held in your hand, weak trees leaning into us as if we were part of the wet dark that sustains their roots under dead leaves and at armillaria. Since honey mushrooms suck 
from the soil chemicals that trigger a tree's defenses. They leach the tree's sap undetected, all the while secreting toxins to stave off competing species. But in the inseparable genetic mosaic of their thin root filaments, the identity of any singular species blurs among interactive populations, twice alive. Near the summit, a gleaming, slick-inside outcrop sanctifies the path, winding through a precinct of green schists whose lethal minerals sterilize the ground. The hum of some large insect immelmanning around our heads calls to mind, you tell me, the low drone of a Buddhist chant. But now we really hear chanting we can't decode. Don't be so rational. A congregate speech from the red trembling sprigs, a vascular language prior to our breathed language, corporeal, chemical, drawing our sound into its harmonic, tuning us to what we've not yet seen, the surround calling us, theoryless, toward an inference of horizontal connections, there at ground level, an incantation, independent of us, but detectable, consummate, always resistant to us, but inciting our recognition of what it might mean to be here, among others, human and not. Here, home, where ours is another of the small voices taking us over, over ourselves, over into the nothing between, the out of sight of ourselves, a litany from spore-bearing mouths as hi-fi stretch their long necks and open their throats, opening a link between systems, a supersaturation of syntax, an arousal even as slow... Rolling walls of high decibel sonar blow out the ears of whales, and fires burn uncontrolled, and slurry pits leak into the creek, etc., etc., femicides, war, righteous insistence, and still, and still, the lived sensation fits into the living sensorium. Can't you hear? Don't be so rational. The world inhale. Hear the call from elsewhere, which is just where we are, no, even closer, inside us, inside the blood pulse of our bodies, the bristle of our mosses, the embrace, and exhale. It's always tricky when people clap after, like, individual poems, because then if they don't clap, I think, oh, that was a failure. My book, Twice Alive, begins with a note to the reader, which it would probably be a good idea for me to share with you before I read any further, um, because a lot of the poems have to do with lichen. What many of us learned in, in high school about lichen, that it's an indicator species for pollution, litmus, in fact, is derived from lichen, and that it's the synergistic alliance of a fungus and an algae, or cyanobacteria, is pretty much true, but simplified. Lichen ecology seems to have more to do with collaboration than competition. And collaboration is transformative. And just in case, I'm assuming all of you know what lichen is. You've seen it on rocks and sort of gray-green stuff. You can't tell whether it's dead or alive. With lichen, which may be more related to animals, and incidentally, lichen... Uh, is found on more than 92% of the earth. With lichen, which may be more related to animals than plants, some scientists say, the original organisms, that algae and that cyanobacteria, are changed utterly in their compact. They can never return to what they were before they merge. And according to Anne Pringle, one of the leading contemporary mycologists with whom I had the lucky opportunity to collaborate, it may be that lichen do not, given sufficient nutrients, age. Anne and other contemporary biologists are saying that our sense of the inevitability of death may be determined by our mammalian orientation. Perhaps some forms of life have theoretical immortality. 
the thought of two things that merge, mutually altering each other. Two things that intermingled and interactive become one thing that does not age brings me to think of the nature of intimacy. Isn't it often in our most intimate relations that we come to realize that our identity, all identity, is combinatory? Forest. Forest is one of the five landscapes that come up in the Sangam poems. So this forest has one R, unlike my name, Forest. Forest. Erogenous zones in oaks, slung with stoles of lace lichen, the sun's rays spilling through leaves in broken packets, a force, call it nighttime, thrusts mushrooms up from their lair of spawn, mycelial loam, the whiff of port. They pop into untrammeled air with a sort of gasp that follows a fine chess move. Like memories, are they? Or punctuation? Was it something the earth said to provoke our response, tasking us to recall an evolutionary course, our long-ago initiation into the one among others? And within my newborn noticing, have you popped up beside me, love? Or were you here from the start, a swarm of meaning and decay, still gripping the underworld, both of us half-buried, holding fast, if briefly, to a swelling vastness, while our coupling begins to register in the already awake compendium that offers to take us in. You take me in, and abundance floods us, floats us out. We fill each with the other, all morning breaks as birdsong over us who rise to the surface so our faces might be sprung. Another of the Sangam landscapes is called Wasteland. It's um, been pointed out to me that in English there happens to be another poem called Wasteland that few people have read. <clears throat> this one is called Wasteland for Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa is the town next to the town that I moved to when I moved to California. That same year that I moved there, the town burned um, because of uh, drought and wildfires uh, stimulated by global warming. Two years later, Santa Rosa burned again. Wasteland for Santa Rosa. Green spring grass on the hills had cured by June, and by July, gone woolly and brown, it crackled underfoot desiccated, while within the clamor of live oaks, an infestation of tiny larva clung to the under leaves, feeding between veins. Their frass, that fine dandruff of excrement and boring dust, tinkled as it dropped onto dead leaves below the limbs. You could hear it, twenty feet away, tinkling. Across the valley, on Sugarloaf Ridge, the full moon showed up, like a girl doing cartwheels. No one goes on living the life that isn't there. Below a vast column of smoke, heat, flame, and wind, I rose, swaying and tottering on my erratic vortex, extemporizing my own extreme weather, sucking up eight acres of scorched topsoil and spinning it outward in a burning sleet of filth and embers that catapulted me forward with my mouth open in every direction at once. So I came for you, turning, turning the present into purgatory, because I need to turn everything to tragedy before I can see it, because it must be leavened with remorse for the feeling to rise. And, um, and this poem is called Immigrant Sea. Sea is another of the, the Sangam landscapes. Human, uh, human migration right now is the greatest in all of human history. People crossing what we now call borders, which didn't used to be borders. And uh, I live with an immigrant to the United States, uh, Ashwini Bhatt. 
So I've been thinking a lot about immigration and also about how waves of any sea are constant immigrants to a shore. Immigrant sea, aroused by her inaccessibility, he aches for more of her life to live inside him, watching the breakers, standing so close he can feel heat coming off her wet scalp. What is his relation to this person before him, so familiar and foreign? The way he searches out her face, he searches out himself. Gusts thrash crests of swell. Spring grasses twirl circles in the sand where they stand without speaking. She wants him to know it's all charged, even grass positive, pollen negative. So when grass waves, it sweeps the air for pollen. He feels electricity all around as though the wild drama of the coming storm were already aware of them, foreigners, on this shore. Little sapphire blue flowers speckle the dunes. He wonders if he has let himself flatten out into a depthless sheet, like escalator stairs, whether in the end he'll disappear underground without the smallest lurch of resistance. But when her lavish face turns toward him, beaming, the corners of her eyes wind wet, he yields to that excess. He reappears to himself. Now I'll show you uh, another uh, movie that's another collaboration, this time with a photographer, Lucas Folia, and a musician named Brady Earnhardt. And the poem is written from hours and hours of interviews with people in the American South who live in what used to be called utopian communities, and now the preferred word is intentional communities, people that live completely off the grid, some groups of them uh, living in um, living together in places where they refuse to kill anything, so they eat um, animals that have been killed by the side of the road, and they eat um, fruit and vegetables that have dropped in the forest. Others who live together for religious reasons. Others um, because even in America you can't have as many guns as these people want to have. So interviewing these people and living among them for a while, Lucas Folia, uh, took photographs after he came to know them. And this poem is derived from their words. Um, And I think it speaks a lot about America, the country that I'm from. Moving around for the light, a madrigal. The natural order of things, sugar bushing, Some things we do would gross people out because they just don't know. Always was baffled by the connections in life. It's moving around for the light. I thought, that plant's growing before my eyes. It's insane. What the news media don't want you to know about. All the wild, edible plants, for instance. Getting on good here, blacks and white. No fossil fuel-based technology. I've eaten owl, wing muscles, and leg muscles. That's the only meat on him. All this roadkill, beavers, otters, deer, raccoon. We cook them up, preserve the hide instead of slashing it. Got it laid out real clear. A lot can be done with duct tape. A bucket of honey between May and August. Who controls oil controls the world. It's a lawyer's racket, but they don't go by law. That's the truth, and people don't even know it. Want to find my bearings and what's real. Started an anarchist collective with 13 others, like myself, independent people. Mountains seem to draw folks who want to live in wilderness. The biggest problems come from being disconnected. I did really well in school, but I didn't like it. 
how do you sustain yourself day to day? Take five milk goats and a sack of sweet potatoes, a grist mill, a harness shop. Most people independent enough to live out here like this. They're too independent to listen to each other. Feed somebody lunch and they cut your wood all year. That works. Until the kids are grown, don't want to bring others in on account of influence. Some things we do would gross people out because they don't know. Where do you think you come by your pattern for your axe handle? Take your old axe handle and lay it on there. Nobody comes in, nobody leaves. We'll mind ourselves, let us alone. They wear people out so they say, I'll just pay the fine. That's the truth. And people don't even know it. I was on her windshield, 20 or 30 feet, and then she hit the brakes. And I flew into a telephone pole. Heard a lot of stories about people's lives, who needs a house, and how much tin. We're different. You can't treat us the same. Garlic, pumpkin, onion, squirrel. And people come to learn to make sorghum. Those that have enough guts to live off the land, they are independent people like myself, but I lived in community, lived with the Amish. With them, woodcutting isn't cutting wood. Wood's a byproduct. That's why you can't use chainsaws. You can't talk to someone over a chainsaw. You want to move in a way that's more connected. See the cause and effect in my life. Right at the start of my senior year, a natural progression from activism and travel. How do you sustain yourself day to day? And people come to learn to make sorghum. What the news media don't want you to know. Those dogs, they're rabbit dogs. Like to lose that feeling of being a foreigner, find a sense of being at home. Out felling trees alone on a windy day, took my eyes off it for three seconds. A big gust of wind came up and blew it down on me. My first thought was, oh shit, I don't have insurance, which is a funny thought considering. Let's get this process right. I'm not quitting unless I feel in my heart I'm going to quit. That's the difference between me and other people. Blue heron is good, tastes good. Ever eat a blue heron? Supervisor said there's no common law in Virginia. We don't know how fast it's going to happen. Food's going to be number one. Next is going to be ammo. We figure we'll end up feeding a lot of people. Took my eye off it for three seconds. First thought was, oh shit. It's a right. It's always been a right. The difference between me and other people. We'll care for ourselves, let us alone. I've got it laid out real clear. Biggest problems come from being disconnected. Beavers, otters, deer, raccoon. I've eaten owl. Hard to feed yourself for a year. Milk goats are the most valuable thing you can have. Banks go down, people can't get money. They're going to see what they need. Food's number one and next is going to be ammo. If bad goes to worse, we'll post a man to keep out strangers. Working to get that other doctor to move here. Like in Vietnam, killing those women and kids. That's not the American mindset. But I think it might come to such. Tanning hides, fire without matches. When others won't, we'll make it. Take five milk goats and a sack of sweet potatoes. You can go anywhere. The natural order of things is where the species gets dominant over its niche. I'm always baffled by the connections. That plant's growing before my eyes. It's insane. Instantly felt comfortable here. Skinned my first raccoon and it looked so much like a fetus, I cried. Don't know how fast it's going to happen or if it'll happen, but if it doesn't happen, we're not hurting either way. Grew up using a bow and arrow to shoot rabbits. Need to be around like-minded people so I can see the cause and effect in my life. They're really strong personalities. I have a strong personality too. Nobody comes in, nobody leaves. Ever eat a blue heron? 
natural order of things. Wing muscles and leg muscles, that's the only meat on him. Where do you think you come by? Your pattern. Let's get this process right. Want to find my bearings and what's real. Move in a way that's more connected. Thanks to my collaborators there. There's just one more poem that I'd like to read, and it's also a poetry film. If you can stand one more, um, this one is called Unto Ourselves, and it's also from Twice Alive. Unto Ourselves. To see what's there and not already patterned by familiarity, for an unpredicted whole is there, casting a pair of shadows, manipulating its material, advancing, assembling enough kinship that we call it life, our life, what is already many lives, the dimensions of its magnitude veiled to us as we live it. Across the cytoplasm of adjacent cells goes a signal that turns you toward me, turns me into you. We are coupled in quiet tumult, convergent arguments, an alien rhythm becoming familiar, a rhythm of I am here, never to be peeled away. We are become one thing, listening for what's there and not. Through the storm, neem trees on the hill stamp wildly in their roots. We have passed through the spring, but what thing has passed through us? Now your laughter transparentizes me, and whose sense of the self doesn't swerve? Your unconditional foreignness grows conditional, stops being foreign at all. With your nearness, my lens on the world shifts. A peristaltic contraction courses through us as a single wave. No longer can we keep our distance, our lips brush, or the tips of ourselves. But what language are you whispering to me, your teeth stained by nilgiri tea, above the trills and whistles in the high limbs, above the screech of a bulldozer blade shoving rubble up the wounded street, above the silence of an eyeless tick climbing a grass stem. I understand nothing but the lust your voice incites, the declamatory tenderness. How and who can say what force has queued up this hour for our small voices to merge into a carnality that did not exist before now? Come to this unforeseen conjunction. We slip into one another. We take hold in a pulse of heat, in a yes and no, for already we can see we are no longer what we were. As I find you within me, not fused, not bonded, but lodged. And for you, is it the same? The intensity of such investment, each of us excited by the volatility of the other, which propels us in a rush as something, perhaps our lips brush or the tips of ourselves, stripping away what? What was before? Was there even anything before? The reconfiguration is instantaneous experience. It is being itself. But who's being now? Was I endowed with some special pliability so that becoming part of you, I didn't pass through my own nihilation? And what does the death of who you were mean to me, except that now you are present constantly? Because excess is what it took for us to transform, to a fold. You cast your life beyond itself. Can't you sense me with your ecstatic openness, like rain mingling with red earth? Without you I survived, and with you I live again in a radical augmentation of identity, because we have effaced our outer limits, because we summoned each other. In you, I cast my life beyond itself. Thanks very much. Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. 
If you like what we do, please share it with your friends and family. You can also leave us a review or rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S. Sarunaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram for updates on all our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.